Hey, thank you. Um, I'm just working out how to drive this. Um, I, Laura made me panic when she said she needed a photo because um, at the start of COVID, I was the super svelte fit guy who'd been working part-time for um, Les Mills and going to the gym all the time with my workmates. Um, and then COVID happened and I like put on like 30 kgs. So I found a photo from that I took at the hairdresser when I just had my hair cut at one point <laughs> where I looked vaguely respectable. So um, just imagine I look like that all the time. Um, good morning. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for coming out so early. That's um, really encouraging to think that people have made the effort to hear me attempt to wrestle all the eels in my brain into a bag um, and put together a talk on ethos. Now, when <gasps> exactly crunk. <laughs> this is crunk. He's not mine, but I'm stealing him after this talk. Um, this is the description that I was given from Creative Mornings. Um, ethos is that specific quality that defines a place, time, or group of people. When you step into a room, a busy downtown, or a community gathering, you intuit its spirit. Ethos is alchemic, ineffable, and infinitely ponderable across place and culture. Which, um, what ways of moving through the world did you inherit? And it's that last, is there a pointer on that? It's that, never mind. It's that last bit, that, oh, there it is. It's that bit there that really grabbed me. So I started thinking, I feel like I have an ethos of me as a person. I feel there's an ethos I'm attracted to in terms of who I work with, places I congregate, things I believe in. But where did it come from? And um, what did I inherit? And this turned into a bit of an exploration. Um, but we'll get into that. Um, kia ora koutou. My name's Mark Easterbrook. Those of you who don't know me, there are some of you who do, which is really encouraging. Thanks for coming. I'm a writer, creative director, I work freelance with design agencies, ad agencies, charities, random random things. Um, my background is in advertising, but I've kind of morphed into something else along the way. Um, and then I find myself doing something like this. Um, I encourage you all just to stop for a moment and think about the fact that we're standing in the ocean. Uh, so everything from, I think it's, Sale Street down um, used to be part of the harbour. So once upon a time, um, Ngāti Whātua or Auraki would have been collecting kaimoana, I imagine, where we stand. And yet here we are on concrete and steel, uh, which is kind of a, you know, everything has a past. Everything has something that's led to where it is now. Um, so just bear that in mind. Think about your own past. Think about how you came to be as we go through this. Um, this isn't an introduction, this is a question for me. Who am I? I went, who are you? How did you get to be the person that Laura emails one day and goes, hey mate, do you want to come and talk? Creative mornings? And I was like, what? Why? Why would people get out of bed to come and see a mediocre middle-aged white guy talk about <laughs> stuff? Um, but I thought, you know, it's worth it. I, I, when I go to things like semi-permanent or talks where someone gets up and goes, and then I did this project, and then I did this project, and then I did this project. I hate it. I want to hear about more than that. Um, hate it's probably a bit mean. But I've put two bits of work in here which um, probably give you a little hint into who I am and what I'm about. This, I'll probably have to ask you to cut out of the video. <laughs> um, so yeah, if anyone wants a slightly earnest feel good brand manifesto, I'm your guy. Why can I write slightly earnest brand manifestos? Because actually, I'm a poet, or at least I used to be, and sometimes it bubbles up. Um, first time in 20 years I've put a poem of mine up in front of people and read it, so you can either close your eyes and listen or you can read it off the screen. This one's called Tidings. Here is the universe reaching down to touch you as you glitter at the water's edge. Here is you, an octopus escape artist pushing into the beyond emerging inch by inch. Here is a hammer, prizing loose the nails of an old house, and I measuring the lengths you will keep. Um, I wrote that about four years ago. Um, I haven't written many poems since, but when I was going back looking for things to put into this talk, I went, oh, that's why you wrote that poem for this talk. 
uh, because it is about the process of emergence and becoming, which um, is what I'm going to talk about, how one develops an ethos. And this talk is called Catching the Eel of Opportunity, which will make a lot more sense, maybe, by the end of it. Um, so what's my ethos? I, it's going to sound weird, I don't care that much about the work I do. I care more about the way I work with people generally. There's people in this room who've worked with me and go, no, he's a jerk, he's so unreliable. Um, but generally speaking, I try and work well with people and help them bring what they want to do into the world. Because as a writer, um, you can't make a video like that or you can't work on a brand, you can't create an experience without all these other people, without the editors and the illustrators and the designers and the photographers and the audio engineers and the musicians and you're, unless you're just writing poetry, you don't get to just be in isolation as a writer. You have to work with those people, you have to hear what they say about what you're doing, offer up what you've got to say about what they're doing and collectively weave something together creatively. And I love that process. I love the process of working on something with someone um, almost more than looking at the finished thing. So that's a big part of who I am. Um, I got thinking about what is an ethos, how do you represent it? And I kept coming back to this image of a rope and the strands that wind together to make a rope. And so I thought, what are the strands? What are the strands of my ethos? Where did they come from? First one I thought was work. Um, welcome to my photo album and Instagram feed. Um, here's my wonderful mum and dad. My dad, here's my dad and my grandfather. That's me. My dad has worked on this farm for, he's 81, he's still working. He's been working on it since he could walk, I can imagine. My grandfather came there when he was nine and worked as long as he was able. Um, my mum was an amazing school teacher her whole life. Um, she was a silver fern. She was one in the team that won the first Nipple World Cup for New Zealand. Uh, amazing swimmer and a nightclub singer. She used to sing with bands to get herself through Teachers College. Incredibly hardworking people who taught me that work matters and working for other people and helping other people through your work matters. Here we are, working collectively on the farm. If you use the word collectively for my grandfather or my dad, they'd call you a communist and tell you to fuck off, but um, <laughs> they're good. Um, I played sport my whole life. Sport was huge in my family. I was a shit sports person, but I knew, I learned the value of being part of a team, being, putting in your effort, doing your best. Here's me at that. Um, you know, and. It, taught me to be someone who was part of things. Here's high school me when I had abs for the only time in my life. Um, you know, and I connected with people. We were, I was easygoing. I was good to be around. <sighs> Through my university years, I worked at the worst bar in the world at the Viaduct. Um, I've probably made about 70,000 coffees in my life. Chopped a lot of wood. I don't, I think this is night time at an ad agency where I worked for 10 years. I definitely look like I've been there for probably 12 hours that day, for the sixth day that week. Um, Ten years ago I built the wreck of it, bought the wreck of a house and pulled it down by hand over the course of a few months. So I work hard, I'm a hard working person mostly. I've got a bit lazy lately but that's because I'm getting older. Um, strand two, strand two that weaves into my ethos is place and a, not so much a sense of place as a wondering about place. Um, you know, I grew up in Whangarei, I grew up in Northland. This is, this carving is from the treaty grounds at Waitangi. Um, I've always known it mattered. I've always known that I grew up in Taitokoro, that it was the birthplace of a relationship and that that coexistence in this place mattered. Could I explain it? No. Could I solve it? No. But it mattered. Um, I come from a rural community where Here's all the people that went off to war. Um, not all of them came back. That mattered. That was really important. The hall where that role of honour is was birthday parties, New Year's parties, funerals, everything. Um, this is where I grew up, looking at the land for 18 years. This is a tree that I'm no botanist, but I've done some research. This puriri tree sits at the top of my 
parents' farm, and I've calculated that it's about 2,000 years old. So think about that. The tree that I've sat under that's been here longer than humans and has had, it sits on what was clearly some kind of parasite. Um, I've got a friend who knows a huge amount about um, tikanga and te ao Māori, and he's told me what this tree might have been used for, which freaked me out a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a power to place. Um, and hopefully you all know this, which is actually weirdly sort of my favourite place in the world. Um, I love K Road. Um, I worked there for a few years, but I've always found myself there since I've lived in Auckland. And there's something about it as a place and that sense of interweaving strands of the things that matter to me. That, you know, that's where I feel like I belong, even though I live out in Tipurangi. Strand three of me um, and what has sort of created me um, is creativity. Ah! Holy. Oh my gosh. Reverse, 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 reverse. Don't read any of these. <laughs> totally ruined it. There you go. Creativity and culture. Um, so, you know, I was talking to Laura about this early, earlier. I'm a weird magnet. I'm a magnet of coincidence. Um, I'm a magnet of serendipity. I don't know why, um, but it's cool. Um, and you can trace all kinds of weird connections in my life. When I was 15, I read and studied at school Punamu Punamu by Wati Ihamara. Loved it, really important fund, um, foundational experience of language and literature. Um, here's me in my early incarnation as a student poet um, in Witte Ihamara's writing course at Auckland University. Here's me jumping forward 20 years as the creative director of the Going West Books and Writers Festival out in Titarangi. I'm holding the toko, which is the Every poet laureate in New Zealand gets their own stick made. This is um, Selena Tisitalamash's one, which I'm holding with great reverence. Um, and here's Wadi Ihamara, a guest in a panel at that session. So that's like 30 years of my life with this thread coming together. When I first came to Auckland, not long after I got a job at Real Groovy Records, um, I became a bit music obsessed. I've been to a million gigs. I know what the power station smells like in my sleep. Um, and in the early 2000s, I got involved at 95 BFM um, as, a, as a current events host, current affairs host, not a um, music person. But, you know, it was a fun, it's a big building block of who I am, this kind of music-based, slightly fringy world. Um, I love films. In 1998, a friend rang me from the States and said, I just went to see a movie and you were in it. <laughs> and, it <was> like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I proceeded to go and see The Big Lebowski twice in the same weekend and go, right, I see what you're saying. Um, I love low art. I found this in my dad's wool shed. This is a copy of Poye, um, a seven inch single, in that illustration of this um, sort of. Māori futurism, this space age waka, just, I love it. Um, and I love high art. Um, this is the lighthouse down the way here. Um, I went, the first time I saw this, I cried, and which is really weird. I went to that house, I looked in the window, I looked at Captain Cook and how his feet just don't quite connect with the land. And it was like, this is everything that I feel about being Pākehā New Zealander, summed up by this piece of art. I'm looking at the land, I know I want to touch it, but I just, I'm not quite there. So, yeah, that was um, one of life's most sort of profound art experiences. Strand four, and this is the one that I think starts to get into the next bit. Someone yell at me if I'm taking too long, by the way, because I haven't got a watch that I can see. Openness and um, you know over so I worked in a big ad agency for ten years after various things and the day I left I went to St Kevin's OK and I sat down at Alleluia and I said to myself internally you need a new chapter in your life and you need to start saying yes not literally to people offering you things but yes to the world. Um, 
And I worked at an agency called Good Folk, and I went to the Wayback Machine and found when we still existed. We're Good Folk, an independent creative agency based on Auckland's Karangahapi Road. And our clients bring us a communications challenge. We solve it with good design, advertising, digital, and experiential ideas. So that was us. And we were a really nice place, and we had a good vibe, and people loved working with us because we were all good people. And it felt like, oh, this, is, this place feels like an extension of me. Um, lots of amazing, profound change happened in that time. We did a project for the Tupuna Maunga Authority, which is um, the statutory body that looks after our Maunga in Auckland. And that was an incredibly immersive bicultural design process where I learnt so much about Te Ao Māori that I could have learnt at high school if I'd been paying attention, because um, I went to an amazing school that was very bicultural, but I just kind of was off on my own thing. Um, but I learnt incredible things with that project. I started coming to this wonderful event. I've been to 30 creative mornings. Um, and I went from being someone a bit shy who had to go, hi, why have you come here this morning? Um, to someone with a coffee cup, to someone who just bowls in and talks to whoever. Um, because I just felt open, you know, I'd opened up. Um, that has led to, I do work with Design Assembly running workshops. You know, that all stems from it. The most powerful thing that happened to me at Good Folk was I met an organisation called Mixit. Um, Mixit works with refugee and migrant young people new to New Zealand, not all of them new to New Zealand, my son goes as well, um, and we use creative and performing arts as a vehicle to build them up as people, to make them confident, to make them feel connected, to make them feel they belong. It's an amazing charity. We used to do their design work. Um, Somewhere along the line, I got invited to be a trustee on their board, and then uh, through sad circumstances of someone passing away, I found myself being the chair of that board. So it's a big part of my life now, working with these young people from all over the world and you know, creating a space where they can belong and feel they're growing as people. I found this on K Road one day, and I'd forgotten about it, and I just found it in my photo album the other day, and um, <laughs> I could have just shown that. That would be, here's my ethos. Fascists are cowards promoting a boring, inaccurate view of the world, exploiting a formerly tolerant system and a shameful attempt to double down on unearned privilege. Their logic is repugnant, their division projected. Diversity enriches all lives, difference expands horizons. Our relationships define us and solidarity demands reaction. They will not be tolerated here. We're in a world where people want to make division. We're in a people where world where people are desperate to make you angry at someone over there. Um, and that sucks. That's really shit. That's a shit ethos. Pardon my language. Um, an ethos of openness and embrace is what uh, I like to try and promote in the world and hope that others will follow. The reason I use this metaphor of the rope is because I was doing a job uh, recently that involved the New Zealand Navy. And I came across this whakatauki up here, uh, Mā te rangatāmiro i nā e torakaha aki ai. By twisting the fibres together, they are strengthened. So we are each strong because of those strands of our own personal ethos bound together. That you become a rope instead of just a little piece of string that can be cut through. So I think it's a process of becoming, but I think I am, I'm a rope now. I'm not a string. That's kind of weird, eh? <laughs> I admit it, weird analogies are my thing. Um, but what can you do with lots of ropes or lots of strong cords? You can build a net. Or you can build an eel trap. Remember when he said that eel of opportunity thing? It's gonna, this is where it comes into being. So at my high school, hands up if you've ever heard of Tikipunga High School in Whangarei. Yes, two. Three. These pe only these people matter. Um, <laughs> I went to a high school called Tikapunga High School, which was, um, depends on, if you asked certain people, they'd say it's the shittest school in the worst part of town. Uh, but it was a wonderful school, and I loved it. Um, and our school motto was Tukua o Punga. Notice these eel traps. That means place to set your eel traps, because we were near a river. But obviously, like everything in Te Reo Māori, it's not one-dimensional, it's not one-layered. It's not a literal reference to K 
catching some tuna for dinner. It is about laying down the things that will allow you to be nourished. And that's what a net is. Um, a net is a source of nourishment. And uh, I think of a net as a series of connections. So all of us are a strand. But just by being in this room, we're currently a net. We're woven together. There's intersection points. You know, there's people here I know and who I've worked with, and we're a little knot in the middle. Um, and from my knot, I can follow a line to a bunch of other people. From your knot, you can follow that line to a bunch of other people. A net can nourish you because in this room, in this room are people who have given me work because they have I've pulled them into that net or I've been pulled into their net. In this room is someone that you don't know is going to give you some work. This isn't like a sly pitch, by the way. Um, <laughs> I've, got enough, I've got enough work. Um, there's some other people here who want some more work. Talk to them. Um, you know, a net nourishes you and a, and a strong net keeps catching enough for everyone. A strong net where every strand is strong and values its connection to the next strong, our strand is strong. And what two strands come apart, that net, that connection fails, and you've got a hole where nourishment slips through. A net holds you safe. You know, if you're a trapeze artist, literally, um, if you are a child on a playground, um, if you are a person in a community facing uh, any kind of obstacle, any kind of stress, any kind of drama, it's that net you've built around you that catches you and that keeps you safe. That matters. That matters that you know that if you fall, you've built your own personal ethos into a web of like-minded souls who can pick you up. And it's Gumboot Friday, so I have thoughts on Gumboot Friday, but mental health in general, it's a good thing to remember. A net can elevate you, so you build that strong net and it becomes something you can climb and not climb all over the top of, but get supported up. So that net you've built, that shared ethos, that community um, can lift you. Um, do you want to see a photo of a terrified middle-aged man? Yes, yes Mark, show us the pain. Um, so I'm up the mast of the Spirit of Adventure. This is earlier this year. Spirit of New Zealand, sorry. Um, this, there's like two points. I'm at the first point, and about two seconds after this, I say to the guy, is it cool if I go back down? I can't do this. <laughs> and he said, do you really want to, though? You have come all this way. Um, I'm terrified of heights. I've been on the Spirit of Adventure as a teenager and done all this then, and it was fine. But I was hacking myself. But... Um, the whole reason I was on a boat is because the network I have built over the last sort of 10, 20 years of working kind of put me in a, in a place where suddenly I could be caught by an opportunity, um, which was to go on this with a bunch of business leaders. And <laughs> I'm not a business leader. I'm a guy who works alone in his house in Tsurangi, um, Zooming people and occasionally going out into the world. Um, I have no one who works under me. but this boatload of people who did lead people and manage big businesses and all those things, um, I found myself there too. And in a life-changing moment, I stopped cha um, biting my nails on this voyage. That's not relevant to this talk. That's just a really interesting tidbit. <laughs> um, for some reason, after four days on this boat, um, I stopped biting my nails after 40 years. So if you need to, um, if you need to stop biting your nails, <laughs> Go on a nerve-wracking sea voyage. If anyone saw the story in the paper where minor celebrity Cassie Roma got evacuated off the boat, that was that trip. It was not as dramatic as it sounded. Ah, see, it's back to there. A strong net can catch the eel of opportunity. So when you've built that strong net around you, that shared ethos, good things come to you. That's what I believe. Um, what does a strong net come from? It's from your strand being strong um, and you surrounding yourself with other strong strands with strong connections. So that's my challenge to you. Um, you know, 
if you sit, want to take something away this morning and go, how can I work on me? Um, think about those strands, you know, find those strands. Uh, find the things that made you and think about why they matter to you now. Weave your net out of those strands. Think about the people that matter to you, the events, the communities, the places, the things you want to be a part of, and make sure that you're keeping that net strong. And then you're going to catch your eels. Uh, you know, I have had weird opportunities come out of the blue. The Spirit of Adventure one was a classic. Um, I worked on the New Zealand Expo Pavilion for Dubai. There's a film that plays in that, which I wrote. Uh, which is a huge project and I got dragged into it quite late in the piece but it was just kind of weird and it had come out of seemingly nowhere but actually it had come out of I did something for this person this person had been recommended me by another person that person or someone I'd worked at on something else and so you follow those knots along the strand of the net and you see why they um, they became strong Ah, wrong button. So I've got another poem for you. This is a poem for you to take away, and um, this is your life lesson for, da to da da uh, for today. How to be an active participant in your destiny. Things will happen. Climb inside them cautiously, but still. You will hear words and waves. Listen fully. They will carry more than you bargained for. Look for dots. They are disconnected holes punched through the world. Find threads to pull them close and re-stitch the fabric. Write poems or let them write you. That's also about four years old and also at the time I went, what's that all about? <laughs> um, and then this week I went, oh, you wrote that poem for this talk as well. You clever little time traveller. <laughs> Um, while I'm doing fuckatokies, this one is an oldie but a goodie. Brownie points if anyone picks up where this relates to an earlier part of this talk. The New Net Goes Fishing was Witi Ihamata's first book when he was one of New Zealand, one of the first Māori writers to ever be published in New Zealand, which is ridiculous um, that that happened in the 70s. When the old net is cast aside, the new net goes fishing. When those who have come before start to fray at the edges and um, are not so useful for the role of nourishing the community anymore, the rangatahi step up and they weave their net and they nourish the community. So if you feel like you're getting into old nets phase like me, I feel like a little bit of an old net, um, this is the time where you help other people weave their net, where you help the young people weave the net that will keep that ethos that matters to you going in the world. Uh, and then they'll go out and they'll catch their own eels, they'll catch their own opportunities, and hopefully they're the people who looked at my poster about fascism and said, solidarity brother, instead of that, oh, I just want to be rich like Elon. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you. Nā mihi nui.